Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's OBSSR Director's Webinar. I'm Jane Simone. I'm the Director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research here at the National Institutes of Health. And before I introduce today's speaker, I just have a few housekeeping items. First, today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted on OBSSR's website in about one month. Today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. To ask a question or comment, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Feel free to ask questions at any time during the webinar. Please note that the chat feature is disabled and all attendees will be muted during the webinar. Following the presentation, OBSSR's Deputy Director, Dr. Janine Simmons, will facilitate the Q&A session and ask your, all your questions to the presenter. And now I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Julianne holt Lundstad. Dr. holt Lundstad is a professor of psychology and neuroscience and director of the Social Connection and Health Lab at Brigham Young University. She is also the founding scientific chair and board member for the U.S. Foundation for Social Connection and the Global Initiative on Loneliness and Connection. Dr. holt Lundstad is an international scientific expert on social connection, the health effects, biological mechanisms, and strategies to mitigate risk and promote protection associated with social connection. Her research has been seminal in recognizing social isolation and loneliness as risk factors for early mortality. I don't think we could get a more qualified speaker for this topic. Welcome, Dr. holt Lundstad. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, the kind introduction and of course the invitation to speak here today. So I'm just gonna take a moment to um, pull my slides up. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, loneliness and social connection and, and what we've learned from, from both research and the pandemic. Okay, so I want to start by acknowledging that the work that I'll be discussing today uh, was certainly not done in isolation. Uh, so I want to acknowledge and express my gratitude to the many who have uh, contributed to this work, the many people who informed this work, and, and the many that have supported uh, this work. Many studies have examined what is the key to happiness, and um, of course, it's it's not success or wealth. It's our relationships. It's close relationships with family, friends, and and other close others. And uh, similarly, in studies that have looked at what brings meaning and purpose to people's lives, at the top of the list again are people's close relationships. So it, it's not surprising that people often don't appreciate what truly matters uh, until it's taken away. It's clear that the pandemic brought greater awareness to the importance of social connections for our well being. But of course, uh, this did not, um, concerns did not begin with the pandemic. And there are decades of scientific evidence um, across multiple scientific disciplines that our social connections are related to our health. But of course, the pandemic did test us in ways that proved that we were not prepared. Um, it simultaneously exacerbated existing problems of isolation and loneliness. It highlighted gaps in our understanding and it challenged our ability to mobilize in a crisis. And people suffered, our, our community suffered, and of course, ways that go beyond COVID specific health effects. And because the uh, concerns around the declining uh, social connection began well before the pandemic, getting back to normal is not going to be enough. And if we fail to act, the consequences may be far reaching. We see, have seen, um, in, in the popular media, growing concerns about what is being referred to as a loneliness epidemic. And we saw this uh, growing um, starting around uh, 2017. 
uh, in 2018, uh, the UK appointed a Minister of Loneliness, uh, as well as in, in 2020, uh, Japan also appointing a Minister of Loneliness. Uh, in, in the UK, not only did they do that, they established a national strategy, national measurement, and uh, a national campaign. Here in the United States, uh, we, we saw the release of a, a US Surgeon General's advisory on this topic. And this is noteworthy because these advisories are reserved for issues in the nation that are the most pressing issues for, the na for national health. We also saw around the same time, South Korea taking more concrete steps by offering to pay isolated and lonely young people the equivalent of $500 per month, so a monthly stipend, simply to re-enter and re-engage with society. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to have served in the capacity of the lead scientific editor on, on the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory. Uh, this advisory took a comprehensive approach to this topic, and I'll note that uh, an earlier version of this um, was uh, reviewed by 53 peer reviewers, and we adjudicated nearly 1,000 um, peer reviews. Uh, so today, my remarks uh, will, will draw upon this, and, and I should note also that in addition to those peer reviews, we, we took great steps to make this um, uh, accessible to the general public. So, so today I'm, I'm going to be drawing upon this work, um, my own research and, and the larger evidence. I'll also note that uh, the World Health Organization has recently launched a, a commission on social connection, um, of which I will be um, serving as a member of the technical advisory group. So uh, I want to really focus my remarks on, on a few key questions, and that is um, just how big is this issue and, and what can trends in society tell us? What are the health consequences? And what are some of the implications for action? So let's start with the first question. What, what is the size of the problem? And is, is it getting worse? So um, according to the Metagallup Global State of Connection Survey, uh, this was a survey of, um, that included data from 142 countries globally. Uh, what it suggests is that nearly a quarter of the global, uh, global population reports feeling very or fairly lonely, uh, and that this is the highest among 19 to 29 year olds. However, um, what we can see from this map is that there is some variability across countries. And in, in the countries where at least a third of the population felt lonely, uh, 22 of the 29 were actually in Africa. So what this suggests is that this isn't just a US issue um, or even a Western nation issue. Uh, but rather, this is a global issue. Now, when we look here in the United States, according to some estimates, and they do vary, but um, according to some estimates, uh, as much as one in two American adults report experiencing loneliness. This is roughly half of the population. It's clear that loneliness is important but it's also not the whole picture. So when we, when we look at global, or sorry, not global, American trends, <laughs> when we look at the US trends um, and look at data from the American Time Use Survey, this is data across the last uh, two decades, starting in, in 2003. And what we can see is that um, the time spent um, in isolation has significantly increased. Time spent uh, with family, um, both um, household and non-household family, has decreased. Uh, time spent with friends and, and other in social engagement and even companionship has all decreased. So while the, the pandemic certainly exacerbated it, these trends did not begin there. And again, 
what this suggests is that, that um, simply getting back to normal will not be enough. If we look back even farther, what we can see is uh, additional kinds of data that suggest declining social capital. And this has been uh, demonstrated in uh, various types of group participation, uh, participation in, in organizations and, and other and clubs and other kinds of groups. This data simply shows um, declines in, in religion that we've seen um, across several years. Then if we look to, da to data that, that it, among those who are in crisis, this is data from the National Crisis Line uh, with 1.3 million co uh, conversations. And uh, the number one issue that arose was relationships. One in three was related to relationship distress and one in five was related to absence of human connection. This corresponds with data across the past two decades showing increases in deaths due to suicide. Then when we look at data, um, more informal kinds of data, this is data um, demonstrating Google trends uh, and uh, searches for how to make friends have re reached an all-time historic high. So what these trends suggest is that um, na both national and international data point to decreased connection and significant loneliness, particularly among young people. But what exactly do we mean by loneliness? Because we hear it used quite um, broadly and in, and it seems to be colloquially used as, as a catch-all term for all forms of lacking connection. But of course, scientifically, we define this more specifically. And I find it um, easiest to, to um, distinguish it from uh, another related term, social isolation, that is also often used interchangeably. So social isolation is objectively being alone, having few relationships or infrequent social contact, where loneliness is subjectively feeling alone and, and a distressing feeling at that. Um, based on the discrepancy between one's desired level of connection and one's actual level of connection. And so, of course, objectively being alone can increase our risk of feeling alone but people can be objectively isolated, but not feel lonely. They may take pleasure in, in their um, time alone and solitude. And conversely, uh, people may not be isolated. They may be surrounded by others, but still feel profoundly lonely. And we um, hear often of people describing this as feeling lonely in a crowd, feeling lonely at a party, or even feeling lonely in a marriage. And so what this suggests is that loneliness and, and social isolation are related but distinct terms. They are both important for our health and both indicators of low social connection. So what do we mean by social connection? <laughs> uh, so my colleagues and I um, uh, proposed the term social connection as an umbrella term to encompass the, the many ways in which uh, this has been measured across diverse scientific literatures. And as you can imagine, different scientific fields have used different kinds of terms. But what they generally fall into are three key components. Uh, the first is the structural aspects of relationships, um, the existence or interconnections among different relationships and roles. Um, in other words, often um, relating to the presence or absence of others in our life. Uh, the functional aspects of, of social connection uh, referred to um, the, the functions that are either provided by or perceived to be available through our relationships. So having people that you can rely upon. And then uh, the, the final component is quality. And that refers to the positive and negative aspects of relationships and, and the recognition that not all relationships are entirely positive. Uh, and so while relationships can be sources of joy and, and nurturance, 
and support, they can also be sources of conflict and strain. And so um, what this uh, framework suggests is that social uh, connection is, is on a continuum with high levels of social connection associated with um, low risk and low social connection associated with high risk. So it's, it's important to put this into perspective because there are, are these growing concerns about an epidemic of loneliness. But as we can see, we are less socially connected in a variety of ways. And as I'll talk about, all of these carry risk. And so it's clear we need to have a common language. Um, and we need to also be careful because if we only focus on loneliness, we may potentially ignore or relegate other forms of lacking connection that may be just as harmful. So why is social connection so important? Um, I, I, I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, but it's a critical and underappreciated contributor to individual and population health, well-being, community safety, resilience, and prosperity. And more details can, uh, about this can be found in, in the advisory. But um, simply put, people who have stronger social connections are happier, healthier, and live longer than those who don't. And so um, the distress that, that many uh, felt during the pandemic or uh, have felt even um, before and have continued to feel uh, is natural. Um, humans are social beings and we are not meant to be alone. Uh, if we look across a number of species, being socially connected to a group serves important functions, whether that's direction to safety, evading predators, the pooling of resources, protection from the elements, reciprocal altruism, or obtaining food, being part of a group is essential to survival. Um, so uh, it, in a paper um, published in Science, uh, what we can see um, from the evidence presented in this uh, is that the social environment, both early in life and into adulthood, is one of the strongest predictors of morbidity and mortality across social species in nature, including humans. In addition, experimental studies uh, um, across them uh, show that social interactions can causally alter physiology, uh, disease, risk and lifespan itself. So this uh, suggests that social connection is a fundamental human need, and many have argued it's just as fundamental as uh, food, water, and shelter. And so um, from this perspective, uh, loneliness can be viewed as a biological signal, much like hunger or thirst that motivates us to uh, re reconnect to others and to meet that biological need. Whereas isolation is objectively lacking that biological need. And um, just like we need food and water, water for survival, that quality matters. And so just like food can spoil and food and water can be tainted, um, we need to ensure that our relationship quality is high um, and, and nourishing. And so um, given that humans are one of the most vulnerable species at birth, um, some have argued that our biology is, um, optim is optimal in a social environment. So when we are alone or not um, with those who can be trusted, our brains need to be more active. And not only does it take more effort to meet the demands of our life on our own, but we must be more vigilant to threats in our environment. And this can lead to dysregulation across biological systems. And when these systems are chronically dysregulated, it can, um, uh, it, it can uh, put increased risk uh, and uh, can have far reaching consequences. So what are these health consequences? I also had the honor of serving on a uh, National uh, Academy of Science consensus committee 
that examined the medical and healthcare relevance of social isolation and loneliness. And after a, a review of the body of evidence, the committee found substantial evidence that uh, social isolation and loneliness are associated with greater incidence of major psychological, cognitive, and physical morbidities and lower perceived uh, well being or quality of life. Some of the most compelling evidence comes from the association um, with increased risk for premature mortality from all causes. This led our committee to conclude that social isolation is a major public health concern. I'll note that this report was published February 27th, 2020. This was just two weeks before the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. And so we were aware of these risks even prior to the pandemic. So where did some of this evidence come from? Uh, it comes from decades of epidemiological research. And in my own uh, research, I, I sought to determine the overall magnitude effect of various forms of being socially disconnected and by examining uh, this worldwide data. Uh, so my colleagues and I conducted a, a series of meta-analyses uh, of this, um, one of them looking at the impact of lacking social connection. This included 70 prospective studies um, and uh, more than 3.4 million participants. And when healthy people were tracked over time, uh, those who experienced social deficits were more likely to die earlier, regardless of cause of death. So more specifically, uh, loneliness was associated with um, an increased risk of earlier death by 26%, social isolation by 29%, and living alone by 32%. Importantly, um, there's uh, more recent data, uh, data on this, a, a recent uh, meta-analysis just within the last year included 90 prospective studies, uh, a slightly smaller sample size um, with due to uh, a more re restricted inclusion criteria, uh, but consistently also found that both loneliness and social isolation significantly increased risk for earlier death. Um, and this one found that uh, social isolation uh, was a significantly stronger predictor of earlier death. In an earlier uh, meta-analysis of 148 prospective studies examining the protective effects of being socially connected, we found that uh, those who are so, uh, had greater social connection had an increased uh, survival by 50%. And this was significantly stronger um, in, in magnitude of effect size relative to those that looked specifically at deficits of, of social connection. Importantly, there are now multiple meta-analyses, including hundreds of prospective studies and millions of participants, and this isn't even a comprehensive list. But what this does do is it underscores the replicability of these findings. And I'll note that um, much of the recent evidence um, also uses large sample sizes and even more rigorous methodology, giving us even more confidence in these findings. So um, to try to understand how serious the threat is, uh, my colleagues and I uh, tried to benchmark this relative to other kinds of factors that we take quite seriously. And so as we see here, um, the, the blue bars um, are depicting the uh, overall effect sizes for that have been reported in other meta-analyses of well-established risk factors for mortality including things like smoking, alcohol consumption, flu vaccine, physical activity, obesity, and air pollution. And then in the orange bars, we see various indicators of social connection. Um, of course, uh, some were inversed, so um, since some are protective and some are risk, so that they're all um, pointing in, in the same direction. Uh, but what we can see is that as far as the magnitude of effect size, uh, that the um, while there is variability across indicators of social connection, these are on par and comparable with these other risk factors that we take quite seriously. 
So um, just to summarize some of this evidence, what this suggests is that the effect um, is robust relative to other uh, risk factors that um, receive quite a bit of attention and resources in, in public health. Um, this was consistent across cause of death. I will note um, that uh, uh, in, in my meta-analyses, we excluded deaths due to suicide, not because we didn't think that was important, but rather we were worried that um, perhaps people would assume that it was being driven by suicide. So the majority of these are uh, disease-related mortality, um, but many of them are also all-cause mortality. Uh, also, uh, what this data suggests is that there are a variety of indicators that predict risk, not just loneliness. Um, so we need to pay attention to, to all of these kinds of indicators. Uh, and this uh, data has um, demonstrated in, um, these as independent risk. So uh, they have uh, controlled for several potential confounders, including age and initial health status, uh, pointing to independent risk and, and ruling out reverse causality. This data is also consistent with other findings that link social connection to better health and um, lacking social connection to poorer health. Uh, so there is um, a, a growing and, and wide literature on um, uh, physical health outcomes, including cardiovascular disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes and other chronic conditions, although I'll note that um, there are far more studies on cardiovascular outcomes. Um, this is also consistent with data on mental and behavioral health outcomes, including depression, anxiety, suicidality, and, and addiction. There's also um, several meta-analyses now looking at um, cognitive health outcomes, including uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease specifically, as well as studies that look at cognitive decline. And there is some evidence to also suggest the economic um, implications, and um, including the, the uh, implications for healthcare spending. So data that shows that isolated older adults um, are related to $6.7 billion annually in Medicare spending. But there's uh, also evidence um, pointing to uh, lower social connection being linked to lower productivity, more absenteeism, and lower quality of work, suggesting that some of the economic implications may be far uh, larger. It's also noteworthy that there's a growing body of evidence that has documented the pathways by which this may occur, giving us important clues as to how it is that um, having better um, or worse relationships can ultimately lead to better or worse health or even one's odds of survival. And so understanding these pathways, of course, are important for points for intervention. So I'll just simply note both the, um, the biological, psychological, and behavioral pathways that, that can link to uh, morbidity and ultimately mortality. I, I do want to note, though, that um, uh, understandably there are concerns about um, the causality of this data, um, given that much of the data is observational epidemiological data. Um, nonetheless, of course, other public health issues have uh, faced similar kinds of challenges. And um, so uh, interestingly, um, most notably, um, smoking the Bradford Hill uh, criteria for causality was used to initially to help um, establish that. Uh, this uh, criteria includes nine criteria or guidelines that put emphasis upon the temporality of the relationship, its strength, the presence of a plausible dose response relationship, the consistency of findings um, in diverse studies, uh, and coherence with other disciplinary findings and, and biomedical theory. Uh, Howick and colleagues evaluated this evidence for social connection against these same criteria. And I note here some of the same, um, some of the supporting evidence for these criteria. 
And uh, what this uh, led these authors to conclude is uh, a likelihood of causal association. I'll note that there is some debate on this uh, um, form of causality and uh, other uh, methods for establishing causality have been proposed. Uh, and while there is uh, fewer studies for these more updated forms, um, they are supportive. Uh, suggesting uh, a potential likelihood of causal associations. So taken together, what this suggests is that social connection is a biologically based human need linked to physical health and survival. But uh, it isn't, at least according to some data, isn't something that often pops up during recent health visits to professionals um, this is just some data from AARP, um, but it suggests that perhaps this may be under-recognized. And so uh, there's, there was a study done by Haslam and colleagues in 2018 that looked at public perception uh, of this issue and its relevance to survival. And ranking the effect sizes and, and the effect sizes relative to uh, more on mortality or survival. Uh, what Hoek and colleagues found in 2018 was that the general public significantly underestimates this and doesn't and an an underappreciation of uh, indicators such as social support and social integration relative to other factors for their health. So um, my graduate student and I recently collected data on this because a lot has changed since 2018. Uh, since this time, the UK appointed their Minister of Loneliness and established a national health campaign. There has been considerable increase in, in public discourse on, on isolation and loneliness and the importance of social connection. And then of course, we experienced a global pandemic. And so many people may have personally experienced this. And uh, what we found in 2023 was nearly identical. What this suggests is that the public perception continues to underestimate social factors um, for their health and ultimately their survival. Uh, we also found that this was consistent among those who were um, who reported significant loneliness themselves, um, perhaps thinking that um, that those individuals may be more sensitive to this information. And what this suggests is that while there may be a greater uh, recognition for the importance um, for our emotional well being, um, it continues to be underappreciated for our physical health. When we asked health care providers in a um, smaller sample, uh, what we find is that this the results were very similar to the general public. So not only is public perception underestimating this, but it also seems to be underestimated within um, the healthcare sector itself. Uh, so what this suggests is that um, social connection may not be adequately recognized or addressed. I also want to note that uh, the social connection is not only important for individual health, but it's also critical for our communities. I'll just very quickly highlight um, some, some of the evidence that we highlighted in the advisory. Um, but what this uh, suggests is that uh, con uh, communities that are more socially connected have better um, population health, uh, safety, and resilience. Uh, so including things like um, evidence around the spread of illness within communities, uh, crimes such as murders and thefts, um, as well as uh, various uh, um, preparedness for, for crises. So I want to just highlight that um, Several studies are have documented the importance of social connections in times of crises. So whether it's a personal crisis such as losing a job or a natural disaster such as flooding, fires, earthquakes, a heat wave, pandemic, or war, the ability to mobilize resources via one's social connections can often be a matter of survival. 
and communities where people know one another um, are better prepared for, respond to, and recover more quickly from natural hazards than those with lower levels of connection, which suggests that um, we also need to be concerned about how connected our communities are. This also, um, I think it is an important lesson that there are many pressing social issues in society and that prioritizing social connection can often help us address these other kinds of pressing issues rather than detract from them. It's also important to recognize that this is relevant across um, the life course and across ages. For far too long, the attention has primarily been focused on our aging population. And of course, that's important. We have an increasing aging population and the societal trends suggest that there are gonna be fewer social resources as we age. However, um, what the trends also suggest is that uh, young, the young, um, younger population may also be less socially connected from uh, relative to previous generations. And given the evidence we have around early life experiences predicting later social relationships, a, a, very, a vast literature on, on a, a, attachment, but early, these early life experiences also predict uh, later physical health outcomes. Uh, so there's a wide literature on ACEs and PACEs. So what this suggests is that we need to look across the lifespan and across the social gradient. There is evidence to suggest that, that there is a, a gradient or a continuum of social connection. So for example, Yang and colleagues um, published data from uh, four nationally representative samples that suggest a dose response effect. And so what this suggests is that um, each of us is somewhere along this continuum. Uh, and, and that um, unfortunately, our current approaches are only uh, focused on the extreme end of it. And so even if our interventions are successful, they only reach a small portion of the population. So we need to expand our efforts beyond individual based approaches to societal based approaches. And so by per, per, um, focusing on the full uh, spectrum or gradient and focusing on some of the protective effects of social connection as part of prevention, we may be able to potentially shift population risks. So um, how do we do that? Uh, when we think of what we need to prioritize when it comes to our health, we often think of diet, exercise, sleep, maintaining a healthy weight, not smoking, but we need to add social connections to that list. And of course, that, that seems very challenging. Um, but we take these other kinds of factors very seriously because we have national guidelines that provide recommendations for what we should be striving for. It's also what is taught to us in health education and what our um, doctors talk to us about during routine um, health visits. Um, it's also um, what's emphasized in public health resources such as this one. Uh, not too long ago, I recently um, I published a, a paper on the evidence in support of establishing national health guidelines similar to dietary guidelines or sleep or exercise guidelines. And so this might be one way we can begin to uh, add, add social connections to this list. I will note that Canada has already started this process. But uh, what, th what the data suggests and what the, um, the pandemic has also taught us is that loneliness, isolation, and social disconnection is more than just a personal issue. Uh, we often hear uh, you know, concerns about government um, or other kinds of uh, institutions or organizations getting involved in this issue. 
um, because it's viewed as a personal issue or a private matter. But what we were what we learned from the pandemic is that external forces can contribute to our um, our level of social connection. And of course, the, um, we understand this from the socioecological model as well. And so um, unfortunately, we, we've placed too much burden on the individual to solve this. Another major lesson that we learned from the pandemic is that social contact is part of every aspect of society. As we had to limit our social contact, we saw how it impacted every aspect of our life. Uh, it impacted education, um, how we work, how we travel, how we shop, how we get our entertainment and much more. What this suggests is that social contact is relevant to every sector of society and that every sector of society um, can potentially play a role in either being a barrier to social connection or fostering social connection. So we need a whole of society approach. So as we look to the future, I want to share with you um, a framework. Um, I call it the social framework and social is an acronym for systemic framework of cross-sector integration and action across the lifespan. I know that's a mouthful. So that's why we use social. <laughs> And it should look familiar to you in many ways, because in reality, what it does is it overlays the socio-ecological model. So it starts with that, acknowledging that the person is embedded within interpersonal um, relationships, communities, organizations, and society. But it overlays that with the health and all policies model, uh, acknowledging that every sector of society can play a role. But we go beyond these two existing um, uh, models by recognizing the importance for um, collaboration across sectors and the importance uh, for that, as well as a few cross-cutting themes, including the importance of recognizing um, different mod modalities of connecting, whether they be in person or remote, the importance of, of considering this across the life course, uh, the importance of equity and the importance of evidence um, and practice uh, and practical solutions across all of these. So given that it's very complex, uh, we uh, I also tried to uh, simplify this by um, putting this into somewhat of a, a, a grid where the columns recommend or represent the levels of the socioecological model and the rows represent sectors of society. And I number each one of those as a way to help us systematically identify areas of opportunity and gaps in this effort. I'll note that most of our evidence uh, really only um, covers about two of these uh, uh, um, cells. And so what this suggests is that there is um, about 95% untapped opportunity to affect change in this. And so um, it, it's hoped that by acceler that by using this, we might accelerate the progress in this area in, in this area. So um, this cartoon I wanted to share with you because it illustrates a common reaction I've seen since the, the advisory has um, come out. And while for many the advisory perhaps was somewhat surprising. For many, uh, this this might felt like it was stating the obvious um, for people who can feel it and see it, that who are experiencing it. Um, but it also illustrates the the perhaps the feel the feeling of helplessness of what to do about it, much like you know the Tom Hanks character um, uh, felt a, a, a bit helpless um, to get off the island. And so um, the the advisory does more than just provide evidence um, warning of, of the potential dangers of isolation and loneliness. Um, it provides a path forward um, through six pillars and importantly, um, it was intentionally um, meant not to be overly prescriptive, but rather to provide some general guidance um, uh, and a framework for a national strategy. So I'll just quickly highlight um, these six. 
So the first is um, establishing a so social infrastructure and the need for places and spaces where people can gather to socialize, but uh, as well um, programs in, in communities to help bring people together. The second pillar is enacting pro um, connection public policies. And so just um, as we often uh, evaluate our policies for the economic implications or the environmental implications, we need to evaluate our existing policies for their social implications and uh, either modify them or establish new policies that may help either minimize the harm from disconnection or promote social connection. The third is to mobilize the health sector. Given the strong evidence we have for the health effects, we need adequate resources and training to support providers and patients. The fourth is uh, reforming digital environments and recognizing that not only um, are digital environments um, potentially very helpful to bring people together, but that, that there may be um, potential harms and so establishing safeguards where appropriate. Uh, the fifth is deepening our knowledge and recognizing um, that uh, while there is uh, robust evidence on, on this issue, that there's still um, a lack of public awareness and we need to invest in um, education in this area, but also invest in um, deepening our knowledge to fill in some of the gaps uh, in our research. And then finally, the sixth pillar of, of this is to build a culture of connection. And we recognize that while we can uh, advance policy and, and programs, that if they don't support our social norms, um, that they may likely fall flat. And so we need norms that cultivate values of kindness, respect, service, and commitment to another. And we recognize that social norms are difficult to change, but as um, those in positions of leadership and influence can model these values, that perhaps this will be a, a way forward to help change some of those norms. So although there have been growing concerns um, about social connection that began well before the pandemic, the pandemic has provided an inflection point for us to reflect and learn and take action. Um, and so whether we call this, uh, you know, an epidemic, a social recession or a public health crisis, that uh, that if if we do not act the pandemic may cast a shadow for many years to come so i just want to conclude by um, asking you to just imagine with me that we there was a brand new drug that was released on the market that could increase your survival by as much as 50 percent reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease by 29 percent stroke by 32 percent could reduce depression reduce the likelihood of developing dementia and even increase your immune response and better yet it has few if any side effects and can actually increase your well-being we would all want to use this medication and perhaps invest in this drug and so of course what i'm talking about is social connection and we need to invest in our social connection thank you Thank you, Julianne. You're maybe seeing lots and lots of hearts and claps floating by and um, explosions of joy. Um, so that's a very nice uh, social experience. Um, <laughs> thank you for the interesting and uh, presentation. I'm Janine Simmons, the Deputy Director of OBSSR, and um, we've received a number of questions from the audience, and I added a few of my own, and I'll share as many of these as I can. Um, as a reminder to the audience, you can still submit questions or comments using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so um, I received a number of questions that I've categorized as related to social networks. Um, so uh, one way to think about this, or one version of the question is, um, let's say an introvert might have a few strong connections where an extrovert might have many acquaintances. And what do we know about the different types of connections within a social network? Um, another sort of version of that same question um, 
I see as, you know, how do you think about what a trusted relationship is? Um, what does that mean? Okay, I'll, I'll try and tackle those. Um, so uh, they're, they're, the first question I think relates not only to uh, personality and individual differences, but also about the size of one's social network and as and the depth of one's um, relationships. So, uh, some of the evidence that we look to when it comes to personality factors, and and there's a lot of conversation around, you know, introverts versus extroverts. Uh, and interestingly, uh, you know, during the pandemic, we saw all sorts of memes around, you know, introverts have been training for this our whole lives. <laughs> um, let's all reach out to our extroverted friends who may be suffering. Um, but the data doesn't seem to really support that. In fact, there was a, a study done by Rich Slatcher and, and his colleagues during the pandemic that showed that actually it was um, uh, introverts that suffered most. Uh, and uh, and and also when we look at uh, loneliness, uh, the the data doesn't seem to support that that um, introverts don't get lonely. And, and in fact, um, some data suggests that introverts may be at greater risk for for loneliness. Uh, so this this might uh, dispel um, some of these popular thoughts that perhaps introverts don't get lonely and, and so we shouldn't make assumptions about who gets lonely and who doesn't um but rather there may be um personal preferences about um how how different uh individuals meet their social needs uh when it comes to uh the size of of one social network there is evidence to suggest that having a diversity of types of relationships or or varied types of relationships can be protect protective. And so what I mean by that is uh, types of relationships such as friends, family members, coworkers, neighbors, um, so strong ties and weak ties, uh, but that different kinds of relationships can fulfill different kinds of needs, much like how different kinds of foods or fruits and vegetables provide different kinds of, of nutrients that, that our different um, relationships can uh, fulfill these different kinds of needs. And so uh, while, of course, it's a, um, having some relationships is better than none, uh, that that there seems to be uh, that that it seems to be that it's a, we need to have uh, more than just a couple um, because and in fact, uh, when when individuals have very small uh, social networks, maybe one or two people that are very close. In fact, many people will often report in research only having one confidant. Um, but then in life circumstances where you might lose that um, relationship, whether it's through death or a move, um, that can put someone at increased risk um, if, if they are their or sole source of support or their sole source of, of meeting their social needs. And so having a variety of relationships may be important. Um, in terms of, of kind of the depth of those relationships, uh, similarly, we do have evidence that, that both intimate close relationships are important, but also these casual uh, relationships, which are often referred to as weak ties in, in the scientific literature, uh, have been shown to have benefits. Uh, so even just those casual interactions that you have in your daily life with um, those that you might encounter, you know, at, at, at the bank or at the grocery store or wherever it might be, um, that these small little interactions um, can uh, play a role on our well-being. So it really is having a variety of, of relationships that, that um, has been linked to various uh, health and well-being outcomes. Thanks, it's sort of interesting to think about in terms of the impact of COVID maybe decreased all of our weak ties substantially, even if we still had you know, good, close, supportive, strong ties in one way or another. Um, the second set of questions I have um, I'm putting in the category of kind of specific populations and how does this play out in specific populations. So you um, talk, touched a little bit about age differences um, and questions related to um, sex, genetic ancestry, race, ethnicity, um, homeless populations, 
um, healthcare workers. So that's a lot, but you know, could you talk a little bit about what is and is not known or what gaps exist um, in the science around loneliness and social connection in, in different types of populations? Yeah, so when we look at prevalence rates, uh, there are a few groups that uh, consistently sh we show high prevalence rate. So this includes um, those who report uh, mental and physical health um, struggles. So, uh, and, and I'll note that the evidence shows some bi-directional influences. So not only can lacking connection put you at risk for, for poor mental health and physical health, but poor mental and physical health can also increase your risk of isolation and loneliness and, and uh, le lower social connection. Uh, there are also um, those who live alone. Um, that doesn't mean that all people who live alone are are lonely, um, but but there is an increased um, prevalence rate uh, among among that group. Uh, those who are struggling financially, uh, um, and that may be due to um, uh, having perhaps uh, less time um, if you're you're working multiple jobs you may um, uh, have less time for for leisure and and other kinds of social in engagement uh, then uh, those that have um, uh, identify with a, a group that is considered marginalized or minoritized um, have also reported higher prevalence rates uh, some of the additional groups that you mentioned, um, so I'll, I'll also mention, along with the health, uh, but may not be obvious to some, is um, also those with uh, sensory or morbil mor mobility impairments um, have also uh, uh, reported higher prevalence of, of isolation and loneliness or, or maybe at risk. Uh, the interesting um, question about healthcare workers, it, it is um, interesting because I have noted that uh, I, and this is just anecdotal, but in invitations to speak to um, organizations around that uh, are, are healthcare providers as well as teachers, uh, I presumed that they wanted to understand the health impact so that providers could share this with their patients or that teachers could teach their 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 students. Um, and in both cases, the the response back was they're actually concerned about themselves. <laughs> um, and, and so I think that there is um, a growing sense of, of burden and there is some evidence um, around burnout among uh, healthcare providers and the importance of social connection uh, as protective effects for burnout. Uh, so those may be uh, important factors to uh, gain more robust data on as we're seeing some of these trends uh, that suggests that that may be uh, a particularly important issue for for these groups and and likely many others. And I I will point out um, I and I should have been a, a little bit more clear about this in my remarks. But uh, anyone at any age, any demographic, uh, can potentially be isolated, lonely lack social support or or have poor quality relationships. And so while some individuals and some groups may face more barriers than others, um, that we ought to be, um, uh, first off, we shouldn't um, assume any, any individual or group is isolated or lonely um, just based on their group status. Um, but also that group status isn't what put that puts them at risk. It's often the barriers that that groups um, often face. And so really thinking about the underlying causes of of uh, of those barriers that we can begin to target to help um, reduce that. 
Thanks so much. Because we have just one minute um, left, unfortunately, I won't be able to get to all the questions. Obviously, this is an extremely um, challenging uh, program, and thanks for your efforts to both um, deepen our knowledge and uh, try to improve uh, lives. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Simone now for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Thank you, Dr. Holt Unstab, for a wonderful talk. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Wanted to also thank our communication team here at OBSSR, headed by Marie Rienzo and folks. And we want to remind everyone that this recording for today's webinar will be available on the OBSSR website in approximately one month. We'd like you to welcome all of you to join us for the next directed webinar on July 23rd with Rebecca Wong, who will discuss the intersection of social science, aging, and health disparities. This concludes today's webinar. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the great questions that you had. Thank you all for attending and have a great day.